What's good, people? These that you're about to watch right now were originally posted on a channel called History Mystery Man. I thought that they were impressive. I love digging into our open wheel history, and I love to hear our legends and participants of open wheel past speak on what it was that they thought at the time, what they experienced, and how their lives are turning out. And some sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. But I love the truth, and that's why that's all you're ever going to get on this channel. Enjoy these, and sub to History Mystery Man. Peace. Hey there, YouTubers, History Mystery Man here. Super excited to bring you today the conclusion of the Bettenhausen story and also hopeful you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel at the History Mystery Man. I'd be forever grateful. And while you're at it, you should get the book. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, it's just the, the collection of photos in here is off the charts amazing. And the stories too, authored by Gordon Kirby with Merle and Susan Bettenhausen. It's absolutely spectacular. You can pick up your copy at racemakerpress.com, racemakerpress.com for your collection, your copy that is, of this really cool book on Tony Bettenhausen and Sons. In the meantime, please enjoy the conclusion of the Bettenhausen story. Thanks for all the support, everyone. Any regrets? Not a minute. You were... <sighs> Me? I could probably do regrets on a couple pages, single spaced. You know, I look back over my life, wish I would have went this way, wish I would have went that way, wish I would have had the courage to call this person. And you're, you're no, none. I, you know, when I thought about that, I, and and it's it's just this is something that most people don't think about. And someone awakened, and not very long ago, being 77, but. First off, the best thing is you've, you've got to be, have your help. You've, you've, you've got to have been Numero pretty reasonably uno. smart in your life. Uh, and this goes two different ways. It's like somebody says, well, how, how's it feel now, Merle, to be, to be old? And I said, first off, I'm healthy enough that I don't feel old, okay? And then the next thing is it's such an honor to be old. Just think of all the people you know who didn't get never there. Never had the opportunity. To Your get father. Old. Yeah, to get old. So, so this is this is not a bad thing. This is this is a badge of honor to be able to enjoy being old. I can't think of anything that I did that I'm not responsible for. Well, except, except the prostate cancer. But most of my life leading up to the prostate cancer, I've earned. I did it. Mm -hmm. And you hear so many other people say, oh, it wasn't my fault. I, I had nothing, you know. And, uh, and people that, you know, weigh 250 pounds or the, they're ill of health and it's mostly because they got high blood pressure pills or they got cholesterol pills so their, their poor body doesn't know, you know, what, which drug to, to influence them at that particular moment in time. And, and, and so mo most of, now you know I'm a veteran too. I, I, I know, I, saw, I did not know that. Uh, I knew a lot about you, but I didn't know that part. I saw the photo in the new book. Well, that's why I was so far behind Gary. You were an army veteran. Yeah, because Gary, see Gary, here's a, we're farming the farm. Well, Gary gets a little girl pregnant and they have a baby. And this is in, in the uh, mid 60s. Well, you had three chance, if you were a man when Vietnam was starting to pick up, here, here's what you had. You, you could be married with a child and be exempt. You could be a full-time college student, full-time taking, I didn't go to college, so how many hours is full-time, but whatever that was or you got drafted, unless there was some extenuating circumstances, which I had, 
because the, the first year they tried to draft me, I was, Gary left the farm and I was the only one doing the farming. So, so I got exempt status because I was the sole supporter of the, my, my mom, mother and kid, or kid brothers and sister. Well, I didn't want to do that all the time, so, uh, and they're after me. So I, and after 1964, I told my mom, I said, let's, I don't want to farm anymore. And, and the property's being sold and there's less farm ground and more traveling on the highway with the tractors. So we had a sale in, in January of 1965. And I immediately went to the draft board and said, I want to be, I, I want to volunteer for the draft right now. So, so I went in, I went in the army basic training at uh, Fort Knox in uh, Mar I went in on March 16th, 1965, ended up uh, becoming a personnel specialist at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, made E5 in, in 21 months, and so I got out as a specialist fifth class, which is really good for two years. They had a quarter mile dirt track at, in Lawton, Oklahoma, called Lawton, Lawton Speedway, and, and that, and I, I was in training during the summer of 65, my first year in, but I went out there in spring of 66 and talked to a guy and, and I, now I had driven to Santa Fe Speedway in 1964 about eight or nine nights in a jalopy. And I told him, oh yeah, I've been driving race cars for a year. So, <laughs> so the guy gives me a ride in a modified and, uh, and I ended up winning a feature race about the eighth or 10th time out. So, so I got the race in the summer of 66, which gave me experience to get a midget ride when I, when I got out of the army. So I had great experience and was lucky enough to, to, you know, get a, get a race car ride and, and just so never, never use any of the, uh, military benefits to, from the VA or anything, but, uh, but very, the older you get, the more proud you are. Of course. You, you, yeah. You, Contributed and gave something back. Thank and, you for uh, the service. What do, do you? Uh, speaking of the army and all the things going on in the world, I'm not going there, but just going to touch on it. Do you? Do you pay attention to politics and world news? Yes, I mean, are yes. are you all over it? Yes. Okay. And I'm a, I'm a, a tremendous Trump fan. I mean, I just broke my heart on November third, and it broke my heart more on with what I think all the shenanigans that have taken place, but... Uh, yeah, but you do pay attention to oh, yeah. politics and yeah. world news. You're, right. you're on it. Okay. I, I didn't... Yeah. And uh, do you have a, an opinion on who, in your mind, was the greatest... She's, I don't know, sprint car driver of all time? Greatest or, race driver Or open time. wheeler? Greatest race driver of all time is Tony Stewart. Really? All time. Really? Now, I can't put him in the Formula One... But but he never drove that. So he, he all never I did. can all I can say he's he's had enough variety, more variety than anybody, in my my opinion. And excelled at in each place. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's yeah, an interesting the greatest, answer. The greatest driver. Do you know him at all? I know him a little, but I know his dad pretty well. He's still racing TQ. TQs. He's eighty two years old. You call Nelson and you tell him I want to have an interview with Tony Stewart. <laughs> see how far that goes. Yeah, so, <laughs> do you know Nelson? Um, no, I do not. I, I am an admirer of Tony Stewart. I, I, you know, my proudest moment in racing in my career was when I got chewed out by Tony Stewart at, at Ducoin. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a kind of a long story, but uh, did you earn it? I earned it, and I'm so proud of it. <laughs> I, I loved it. I was it was a it was an ARCA race. I was the pit road reporter for you remember Speed. Oh, yeah. I was their pit pit road reporter for a time, and I, we were doing an ARCA race. And Tony Stewart was there, and he didn't win the race, and he's never happy in that situation. Uh, after the race, we're live TV on Speed, and I the producer is in my ear. Says, "Hey, you, you got Tony Stewart?" I go, "Yep, he's right here." He goes, okay, because we're coming to you. I go, well, we can't right now because he's interviewing with a radio guy. And the producer said, uh, too bad. You know how this goes. This is right in racing, TVs first, then radio, then print. This is how it goes. I go, I know, I get it. But I really don't want to interrupt Tony Stewart while he's giving an interview. So please, and the producer said, bullshit. In three, two, one, go. So what do I do? I interrupted Tony Stewart. Well, Tony gave the interview, very professional, 
gave the interview. And then when we were clear of the live telecast, he laid into me. And, and then some, and it was my proudest moment in all of racing when I got chewed out by Tony Stewart. <laughs> and I had it coming, but he didn't understand, you know, my side of it, what, what I was up against. And, uh, you know, the next year I went back and I took a picture with him because he came back the next year. I took a picture with him with his ARCA car. Uh, he got on the PA that day. Uh, Frank Kimmel had won two races in a row right. at DuPont. He came back a third time. It was clearly bothering him that he hadn't won that race yet, this ARCA race. He got on the PA and he said, I don't know what's going to happen today, but I guarantee you Frank Kimmel isn't going to win this race. <laughs> and guess what? He didn't. Tony Stewart won the race that day. And I took his picture and I said, told him I was going to put it on the ARCA website, you know. And, I didn't know that. That's and, cool. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and my camera didn't work. So I had to go back to him and say, hey, look, my camera didn't work. Can you take it? He looked at me and said, you know what? He goes, you are wearing me out. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear him saying that. Uh, classic Tony Stewart, man. I, 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 he's, the, he's, the, he's not only, like you said, in your opinion, the greatest driver. And he's, he certainly ranks right up there. You could make that case. But he is so real. Um, he's so real. He's what every racing series needs. Absolutely. Like he lets it hang out, not only on the track, but he's going to tell you how he sees it off the track. And his candor, his personality, his, his, his direct nature is so compelling and interesting. Yeah. And racing needs more Tony Stewart. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I hope I didn't bore you with my stories, but no, that's, you great. Know, that's my only Tony Stewart story, and I'm pretty proud of it. No, I, I met Nelson a, a number of years ago, and... Uh, he called me. This is Nelson, right? Yeah, Nelson. I'll show you. Uh, you sent me first. Did you see that? You ever seen I, that, that story? Thought you would like this? The, the 10 the, best post-war IndyCar drivers who yeah, never yeah, won the Indy 500? Yeah, Tony. I sent this to Nelson, and it's uh, it's my dad and his dad. or I, My dad and his son are in it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's and, awesome. And so I sent him, I said... Uh, uh, thought you would like this. Ah, yes, very interesting. Thanks. I said there is a great son and a great dad in the in the top ten. So, uh, can I agree without sounding biased? I said yes. <laughs> so, so then he sent me this this Christmas card. Ah, oh, that's okay. awesome. So, from from Nelson Stewart, yeah, Tony's Nelson, dad. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I love it. So I love Christmas too. Yeah, so. me too. So anyway, so. We talked for about an hour after he called me. After, so anyway, but no, what a wonderful man! What a wonderful, wonderful man! So, how do I interview Tony Stewart? Is Tony Stewart too busy for a guy like me? You think? Uh, well, yeah, I don't think he'd take this long with you. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go to Merle Bettenhausen for the five-hour edition. <laughs> yes, you do. We lived in Tinley Park, and when they ran the speedway. A week later, they were in Milwaukee, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You could almost draw a straight line right through Tinley Park. So there were years and years that people would would stop on my way, on their way to Milwaukee, and spend a couple of days with us. Yeah, because we were only about a hundred miles from the state fairgrounds from our place. And one year might have been fifty-three or maybe fifty-three. Vukovic stops and his wife Esther. It, it, Stop where? No, at, at our house. At your house. After cool. the 500. Wow. And I was hoping you'd have a little Bill Vukovic flavor oh, story. You, you've never heard this one. This is going to be great. So, so he stops there. And, and of course, our kid, you know, Gary and I are there and we're 13, 15. And Vukovic goes. Was that a big deal for you guys as kids to have Bill Vukovic come over to your yeah. house? No, okay. Well, he wasn't as big as our dad. He, oh. <laughs> he wasn't as good. And he wasn't, if you look at his record. He just had. He just figured out the speedway. He no had the speedway it. figured out, yeah. So he goes, yeah, he said, uh, and obviously my dad had been bragging us up or whatever. He says, you know what? He said, we'd see him at the racetrack. See, Bill lived in California. He wasn't here. But we, we'd go to all the champ car races, and we'd, we'd still see Bill. And, you know. And he, he, Bill Vukovic was not an ostentatious guy. I mean, he was... He, he was, was more like Gary than. Yeah, I mean, he he would shy away from the media. Yeah, he but, didn't but he didn't he like all the attention. The racers and, the, and, and and he said, you know what? He said, my kid's so tough he eats nails for breakfast. Who said that? 
Bill about his kid. Really? Yeah. You remember him saying that? Oh, do I remember him saying that? So, uh, so he he said he's eats nails, you know, hoo hoo hoo, you know. And so when he stopped the next year, and I'm thirteen. 12, 13. He had already won the Indy 500, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah so, okay. So he's sitting at the kitchen table, and I get up, and I go out in the shop, and I, and we had all you know, nuts, bolts, too. And I get some, I don't know how, how many penny these nails are this big. But I, but I bring in about five of these nails, and he's sitting there next to my dad, and I, and I go, and lay those on. Here, how, let me see your kid eat those. <laughs> And that is a God's true story. That uh, that uh, uh, and he laughed, and my dad laughed, and everything. But, well, uh, was Vukovic a good man? I mean, did, did, the uh, old man? Uh, yeah, the old man, senior. I think he was just just kind of a not misfit isn't the right word, but just different. Just yeah, dif just different. Yeah, I I always have said and believe that the the Indy Five Hundred Roadsters, the Curtis Craft and the A.J. Watsons and the other varieties they had back then were and still are the prettiest race cars ever mm -hmm. built on earth. I, I, and I still think they are today. Yeah, it just, uh, and it even, it almost, it, it, it's, it's almost like when they went to, when they went from the uprights, the dirt cars, right, mm -hmm. to roadsters, Oh, the wussy's got to drive oh, a road. Here we go, now. here we go. I mean, seriously, because that was it. I mean, the T-shirts, yeah. you know, and, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. on the bricks and down the front straightaway and whatever. And then that, and those Blue Crown spark plug cars and oh. no vise. Oh. They, they you remember to, those? They, they, they went to the kitchen. Yeah, well, I remember my dad drove them. What about that Bellinger car, the 99 car? Yeah. I think that's in the museum, isn't it? Or one of them? No. No? Uh, no, it's it's owned by... Oh, oh, the, yeah, the, the dirt car. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's... A, my dad didn't make a lot of... Well, he made some improper judgment calls at the Speedway. Even though he, he won a race in 50, won a couple of dirt races in 50, because uh, he was driving for Ballinger, and, but he thought that the car was too light and it, it, it would, wouldn't last 500 miles, so we gave it up for a Blue Crown spark plug car. And Lee Wallard and, won and the race. Lee Wallard hired in it. And uh, and so Lee Wallard... Uh, 1951. Know, ...drives the car and wins the race. Mm -hmm. Then he gets burned at, at Reading in a, a sprint sprint race or a dirt race. And then, and then Chris, my dad gets back and wins eight out of 13 races in it. And, yep. and he's a champion in that. I know Raleigh always said that he thought that Poncho was like... One of the greatest. He, See, here's what nobody remembers. Poncho never raced Gary with two good arms. Think of that. All I, the good I, races they had, Gary had the bad arm. Gary had Gary's arm. Now there may be a spot race every now and then, but they never raced, you know, weekend and week week to week with Gary's bad arm. I mean, Gary had a bad arm from seventy. 74 on? 74 on. Yeah, he was and a, a one-arm guy. And that's when became a superstar. Yeah, I get it. I get it. See, what you... You know, you, the story I told you about when you befriended me at Terre Haute when I was a little boy and mm -hmm. I went home, think I left that day thinking you were, uh, you were my best friend. I'm telling you, I am leaving this interview today still thinking that Merle Bettenhausen is my best friend. Well, you know it's what? Been, it's been fantastic. You know, that's so nice. Do you know, when, it, when you're 77 years old, if you don't know who you are and, and what you do and how you come across, then I, I kind of close my, my prayer out with God every night and I go, God, thank you for giving me the capability of making people smile, making people laugh, and making people stronger because that's my it's not my mission it's what I do and it's not what I try to do it's what I what I represent and uh, and I and why how I don't know but I just love to see people smile it just is 
Well, you, you put a smile on this little kid's face when he was 12, I can assure you, and I'm still wearing it, you yeah. know, <laughs> all these years later. But, the, but does, it, doesn't that kind of encompass it? I think I it explains said? it pretty well. My only goal in life, in everything I did, I tried to be better than the people that surrounded me. And uh, I, I tell this story to young people that just outperform everybody that's around you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a goal you can have it at, no matter what you do, or who you are, or who you are, what your, what your goal is, whatever else. And if you decide that, ah, I did okay, I don't want to do that anymore. You can still have another goal by doing something else and being the best at whatever else you do. So, just my, my thinking is very simplistic but it's, it's reaching for the best.